And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us all the way from Poncho Games, creators of the upcoming deck building arc, deck building game Clash of the Medieval. The one and only Pablo Guevara. How are you, how are you doing today, man? Uh, how are you? Thank you. Thank you for, for allowing me to to be here. Thank, thanks you for, thank you for coming. Um, so I, I tend to start with the humble beginnings, as it were. Um, what can you t now? Obviously, you got you guys have have you guys have put in the whole stamp of proudly. Um, designed in Ar in Argentina in Argentina and yeah. that I um while I'm familiar with the tabletop gaming scene in certain um different countries all all over the planet um I will admit that I'm not as familiar with what with the uh, tabletop gaming scene in Argentina what can you tell me about what what it was like going in um breaking out into that scene Oh well. Um, first, probably Argentina has um, they it has great designers, but we don't have a market actually to show our designs. So um, maybe you you have uh, a couple of, of products that stands out from the rest, but we don't have that large board game community here. Um, Usually, the people that start with board games here in Argentina was because, I don't know, they travel and they went to Europe or USA and they found out that this is pretty cool. Um, and now we're on the on the beginnings of the market. Right now, here, we have our first board game bars and, and there's one or two conventions. But, we, well, we on the, we're on the early stages of the, of the market here. But... Uh, I, I get to the board games about 20, year, 20 years ago when I was working in the Germany. Um, and I get to know all this, and I want to bring some of that to Argentina, but it was quite difficult. Um, actually, we don't have a market. You, you, it's like uh, the, the companies are not interested in, in, in being here. They're not interested in, in showing their games here. Uh, right next to us, there's Chile. That is uh, amazing, the difference between Argentina and Chile, because Chile has a board game uh, community there. We are on the early stages right now. So uh, more humble that our beginning, well, it, it, it would be impossible to find. Uh, and the history of how this game came along and how we build this game, uh, it's maybe one of the most inter interesting things about the game, because it's not... Uh, like the usually history about people that it's a board game geek and they get together and they decided to move to a game uh, and then decide to create a game. Well, this one was a slight different. Uh, it was more uh, a game um, seeing the international uh, way, I mean, the international possibility to, 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 to show the game that in our own country. Yeah. And when now you're now if i'm now if i'm not mistaken clash of armies medieval is a de, is a um deck building game um yeah what was your what was your first introduction to the concept of deck building games especially since um that's far that's still is that's still a genre that while it's um well it's been on the rise in the la, in the last decade it's still yeah. a bit it's still a bit of a niche compared to on trading card games like magic yeah yeah well the uh, the i get to to the to the deck builders because of dominion i'm a huge mm -hmm. fan of dominion um i was about 10 years ago or maybe more about 10 years ago i was on a convention uh in germany and the there was some guys playing their dominion so the first time I see that mechanic of adding more cars and making more powerful decks, uh, I mean, I fall in love immediately. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then when, when I came back to Argentina, I get a lot of uh, copies of Dominion, a lot of expansions. And once I start playing with the game, I, I, I mean, I'm a huge fan and I really love it. But there was a, a moment that I feel that, uh, I don't know, it feels some kind of a, uh, different when you play solo than playing with another uh, another players. It's not that different. I mean, it's not create this competition or, or this head to head. Uh, so I will start start thinking about to create a concept of dominion uh, with this with more interaction between the players. Uh, and then Star Realms come, uh, and and that that was the opposite. It mm -hmm. was total head 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 to head, uh, and I really love it. Also, I am a huge fan of the Star Realm, Hero Realms, and all that kind of deck builders. Mm -hmm. But also, I feel that they're uh, they are in a point that they also get this interaction problem that there's some kind of flatness on the way to play both both Dominion and Star Realms. In a way that, the, even though you have an interaction and you're playing against your 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 opponent, it's not like you are playing against it. It's just like you're playing with your decks, and, and uh, that's pretty much it. So, uh, I was trying uh, to to seek another way to to play the game and to make it more interesting. So, I mean, I love the builders, and and I think it's a great mechanic. Uh, that you can add uh, any type of game uh, to be part of, an, of a game, but like you say, it's an it's an edge uh, still. Uh, we're, we're I think we're on the beginning of the of the um, creation of the best tech builders that are going to be around. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I I I I might say that I'm 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 here because of the minion. Uh, but now I think we we're gonna have to make the next step, like it happens with a lot of uh, other mechanics, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That that's very much a history. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of Dominion. <laughs> I might say. Yeah. And would it be would it be fair would it be fair to say that the that that some of the early design ideas for Clash of Armies was a response to that interactivity issue that you've that you've had with a few other um deck builders yeah totally i mean there was um uh in the beginning of the game uh people says after playing a while with the game they say yeah okay but it's pretty much like dominion i mean it was like i, I didn't get uh the that thing that can make me um separate to the concept of that game Mm -hmm. uh it took me a while to to get to get to the idea that i need to create something that uh it will be different from this from the thing that i really love and that from the thing that it's already on the market so i start thinking about some concepts and then all of a sudden the 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 concept of having fortification and garrison and defense and attack mm -hmm. came up and well, it changed completely, completely the game because um, maybe I, I skip a little part of the history, which is that this game it doesn't start as a tech builder; it's a start as a war gaming game. Mm -hmm. That in some point, in some point, you go to when you you have these huge armies that you move around with the map, and when uh, both uh, two armies. Uh, get together and clash actually mm -hmm. they go to what i call a theater war that it was pretty much like a a battlefield when you have this deck builder uh game so it was really simple because it was just a small part of the game the deck builder part so when i decide okay well in argentina there's not going to be possibility to produce this because we have a huge uh hex style game war and moving things and everything so I kept only the, the small part, which was the card game. So I, I started working with that. And that was the, 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 the rest of the history that just came up. It's like, well, but that time it was pretty much like Dominion uh, or, yeah, pretty much like Dominion. So I have to start working purely with the deck builder. So then the, the new concept of the game came. Um, and well, it's like, I, I end up with a 
core mechanic that it it's pretty wor it works really nice because it puts you in a way that you have to decide from each in on each round if you are going to attack or defend yourself which is um something different than other tech builders that you usually buy stuff to attack and that's it uh in this case you have to decide on each turn depends on what your opponent has uh, or, or you think it's going to have as attack. You have to think it will, you, you are going to attack or you're going to defend. By, by defending, you may sacrifice your cars. Well, there's some, some issues there that you have to, 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 to think about on each turn. So in that point, when I create that concept, which I call in the game garrison units on the fortifications. It's just like, well, it, it, a new game born in that. A new, it was the beginning of the game. Mm -hmm. So I start to develop with those concepts. And well, it turns out that this COVID thing on the last year allows me one thing that also, again, because I'm from Argentina, there's not too many places to do play testing of the game. Uh, this COVID thing makes the the Discord server, like we're, we're talking right now, um, mm -hmm. explode. And one of the servers that was awesome was oh, not just one. There's a few of those are the playtesting servers, which all of a sudden you have uh, 1,000 people that each Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, or whatever, they're trying out the game. And there was, a, there was another thing, which was the tabletop simulator that allows mm -hmm. you to develop the game uh, seek, uh, try on Monday, see if something is wrong, fix it, and on Thursday you're you're trying a new edition. Well, all that all that virtual thing, it reduces the pipeline of production and it adds a lot of things to the game. I I think that I don't know if the uh, I don't know if I say it correctly like this, but if there wasn't for this situation that everyone's moved to the virtual world, uh, I I don't know if I will get now to the point that I get with the game. With the yeah. quality of the game. Uh, well, that's, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, that's the history of the mm -hmm. game. I mean, a lot yeah. of work in the playtesting. Now, you admit you had mentioned that this um, st that this started that this started out as a war at this started out as a bit of a um, war game like thing. Um, Pretty much, yeah. Was when it came to when it. That bring that brings me to the that brings me to another to another question. Was it that war game origin that was the reason why you went with a um, high medieval motif for the game? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I love medieval. Mm -hmm. I, I used to travel to Europe to work, but I usually take a couple of days off to see if I if I can find a new castle. Uh, a new place to to know about medieval places and everything. Uh, mm -hmm. I I actually do some tours on Germany only for seeking uh, castles. Uh, so th it was always my motive. Uh, I really love the the medieval era. Um, and when I create this war game, the, this war game, uh, yeah, the medieval came right into right immediately. I mean. I have two eras that I really love about war games, which one is the medieval one and the other one is the Napoleonic Wars. So those are for me the the, 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 the niche, you could say, mm -hmm. that I'm, in, I'm really interested in. Uh, yeah, medieval is what I like most. Yeah. And given, now given that, given that with the, with the um, setup that you have, that you have, now you mentioned the whole thing with the whole thing with garrisons, but what else in particular would you say that you that um that you had that you had tried to do to make sure that you didn't fall into the trap of oh this is like Dominion that you had mentioned um, beforehand? Well, the first one was uh, to consider the game not being uh, sing. Uh, I mean, not consider the game as a single game. That even if you play with twelve players, like you can play on the minion, it's always a single game. I mean, you have some interactions with your opponent, but it's not that much. I mean, you can put some cards in there, and that's it. Um, I think that what 
I try to keep always outside from the Dominion concept was that was to have in this head to head or face to face uh, um, uh, interaction with the other players. Mm-hmm. Uh, not to not to consider as much as yourself on the game, but consider your army against someone else. Uh, I mean, on Dominion you have the concept of you you want to build yourself the biggest, uh, well, the biggest kingdom in a way. Uh, mm-hmm. But in in this game, you, what you are trying to do is to get the best, not the the biggest, the best army to uh, confront your opponent. Mm-hmm. So that gives you, uh, well, there was a reviewer that also said on some review that I saw that one of the things that I really like about the game that also hate about other deck builders is that they used to get a lot of cars um, and you end up with huge decks. Well, in this case, you will not end up with a huge deck. You will you start with 10 decks, mm-hmm. well, sorry, we start with 10 cars and you probably when we, you will end up with 15, 17 that they're not going to be the same one as the first 10 because all the, the, the idea of each turn is to get a more option, uh, more optic, uh, optimal uh, mm-hmm. card deck. So I think that this concept of not having the largest by having the best is what stands from, from stands away actually, stays away from Dominion. Yep. Now, when it comes now, when it comes to the, when it comes to that head to headness, um, and I, I'm get now with with some, with plenty of deck building games, they they kind of do an inbuilt um, assumption that you can that you can go with a larger amount of people at the table. But in your case, you're going strictly with a two player setup. Um, was that a was that a deliberate choice to ensure to ensure that he- that head to headness with the game? Well, yeah, in the beginning it was a, a two players game, um, and it's still a, a two player game. But because of the of the introduce the, the the try to introduce the game to another markets to to actually to Kickstarter, um, some people already on the first official showing of the games on some uh, on the early days of the year on the, some virtual conventions all everyone loves the game but there was a lot of guys that told me why don't you go for a four game player or a six game players um even though you can i mean we try it you just by adding more decks uh, by, i'm sorry by adding more cars you can you have a uh, four players game and if you add more cars you will have a six player very much like it happens when another had to have the builders but i don't feel really comfortable about the idea i want this head to head thing i mean i want to go it's me against the other uh, player mm-hmm. um but because of this early feedback that we get we start thinking about how can we introduce more players to the game but without without losing the medieval uh, concept or the medieval theme so mm-hmm. we end up we came up with uh, with uh, new cars that allows you to play up to four players, mm-hmm. but not not in a re- not in a regular way that you will see on another players. I mean, this game uh, the four player that I, I mean we're testing right now uh, are we it's gonna be part of the stretch goals of the Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things one of the things about these four players or, or three to I mean three and four players what we are adding. Um, is that you start all against each other, like in the regular game, but in the middle of the game, you will have some new phase, which is a diplomatic and economic phase, mm-hmm. that you will have some cards to deal diplomacy and economic against another players. So you may end up with uh, temporary agreements not to attack between some players, uh, mm-hmm. or there's some, then some other agreements, like bloodline agreement that you will uh, well, in the middle of the game, decide who is going to be your partner to, for the rest of the game. So, adding that on the beginning, uh, we I, I thought that oh, I, I don't like too much the idea, but I might say that right now we're playtesting that with my own playtesting server, and turns out this is great. I mean, it it has a whole new interaction between all the players because you have to deal 
um, you start to start to make some diplomacy with the other players. So you start the game playing all against each other, but you may end up the game playing two versus two or three versus one, or you can stay playing all all together. I mean, all against each other. Uh, so now I might say that the game is a four-player game. Mm -hmm. Now I I I. I I am confident enough with the game, with the cards that we designed that I can say that the game has a four-player game uh, option. Yep. But usually it was a two-one only. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the um fate when it comes to the phases of each turn, um obvious obviously you have these have set up that battle um um resource. Uh, market and um, ra and wrapping up. What I do find yeah. interesting about that is that you end you end up you end up with a bit of an inversion of how it typically works. Not just not just with deck building games, but with card games as a whole, where the setup and actually using resources happens first, and combat happens second. But in your case, you ended up doing the reverse. Um, what was the reasoning for going with that particular flow, where um, going to market and is the second to last thing that happens during a turn? Well, uh, mostly playtesting. I mean, um, this game was was on our table since four years now, almost mm -hmm. five years now, um, and I came up with over four hundred cars already uh, designed uh, that we uh, create to the game. Actually, that I create to the game. Then now I have a a few partners on the game, but the first four years it was only myself. Um, and I have these cars that I really love. That it uh, it needs some structure mm -hmm. to have a sense of it. Uh, have uh, I mean they need the structure of this first military, then economic to make sense in a way that. If you use the military, some of the military cars told you to take cars from your discard or from your scrap or whatever. And if you don't take the, the, the steps of first military, then economic, you can make a mess around with that. If someone can, uh, I mean, someone can overrule some of the rules of the game itself. Because, I mean, there's some cars that allows you to take cars from your discard. But if you put the, the economic first, it means that you get the car and it will not be the concept of using when the when the, the car that you take is on the shuffle and it's going to be your main deck. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, I buy it and then I have cars that allows me to take cars from a disc car. So it was like, some in some way, it was like one rule gets in top of the other and they um, they start messing around with the with the... Uh, with the rules of the game so uh, because i don't like that idea when i do this 108 cars cut off mm -hmm. i create this concept that okay any car in from the military it will not affect the economic but economic cars may affect the monetary but because it's on the second phase and you already do all your military stuff mm -hmm. you cannot do more when you buy stuff that's it that's a way to control this this uh, this slice problem on the rule of mm -hmm. the game, and it was I, I, actually the third phase, which is wrapping things up. It's the same concept. It's the way that you all the cards that you're using, you will not put on the discard until you buy everything. You do all your military, then you will put all your cards on the discard and shuffle mm -hmm. and draw and everything. Mm -hmm. It's creating this structure. To avoid, um, I mean, it's to avoid broken rules, actually, and it it works. It works pretty pretty fine. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the resource part of it, and this is a question that I that I often ask of games that ha that have specific cards that are dedicated to resources. Um. How do you how do you minimize how do you minimize within the design the issue of um, flooding, um, either flooding or screwing? It's basically the um, basically the equivalent of mana screwed or mana flooded from Magic: The Gathering. Yeah, well, I, I think that again, I might say a lot of playtesting. 
uh, it, on the beginning, the, the the attack value of the cars and the defense value and the and the cost of the of the car, it wasn't it wasn't totally unbalanced. So uh, we start by reducing the resources uh, and trying to see what happened. How much is the top of the resources that I can have on hand? And we we by by balancing we start having this um, play testing in a way that it was. I mean, the game has when you play a game when you when you develop a game. One of the things that you really worry about is that someone like you say flow the game or, or broke the game. Uh, so you have to balance and you have to do a thousand play testing if you must, mm -hmm. uh, because if you do that you will get to the point that everything is going to be well it will it will uh, be smooth so it will not make the game to end up fast or slow i mean you will get a time defined on your game okay this is a 30 minute game it can take 25 and it can take mm -hmm. 35 but it's, if, if it's take 15 well that's not a great balance on the game so we if you came up with some playtesting that end up like that we still we we have to redone everything so mm, the the thing is that uh, i think that i have an advantage that mm -hmm. not just me all the designers are now having an advantage that probably uh, i don't know baccarino when he designed uh, uh, other <laughs> on his time the, the the game doesn't have which was the immediately playtesting mm -hmm. i mean I can do a game, see a problem on one car, go to my software, make a moment, modify, put it on the tabletop, and we try it again with the new balance. All that thing, it makes the game really, really um, smooth in a way that it, all the, the numbers that are down there are quite balanced, actually. There. So you will not feel that, you will not have that feeling that, oh, yeah, there's too much resource or there's not too many. It's, well, it's balanced, <laughs> but I might say that that probably we will will it's gonna be because of the huge amount of playtesting that we're doing on the game. I mean, I'm talking about uh, here, right now we have over over 300 uh, mm -hmm. playtesting games done on the game, and we're still having some small slights, really really slights, uh, of balance on some cars. Yeah, uh, that well, I, I I don't know it's. In, in in the past, I have experienced the, the, the designing games in the past. There was a point that it was frustrating to you because you do something, you put on the on a or you go to a club to try the game, you put on the table, someone broke it immediately. So you have to wait until one month again to try it out again. And so it you do that one, two, three. By the fourth time, you get frustrated and you or you toss all the project or you will start con uh, consider well it's unbalanced and that's it uh maybe twitch a little bit when the game comes out and mm -hmm. on the first print on the other planes you can modify something but uh right now we have a lot of tools to avoid that and to do that in a private way uh so uh, I, I i don't it's it was well it was trial and error i might say that it was trial and trial and, and error Mm -hmm. Actually, and with that kind, of, with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, um, now of course now, one of the one of the um, mechanics that I found in, that I found interesting looking at the PNP version was the concept of scrapping, um, the idea of being able to quick the being able to um, get additional resources, but having but having to dr having to um permanently lose a ca that um card in the process um what what was the and what was the int what was the was that something that was born out of play testing or how did that particular mechanic come about well i i love to scrap cars uh i'm a huge fan of scrapping cars mm -hmm. and and i add on the, at the beginning of that but maybe the one one rule that changed everything was to add in on the on, not on the resources that you start with. I mean, you start with six, six 
uh, cards value one and one value two and all of them can be scrappable you can get rid of those when you when you draw it uh, but the ones that you buy they will not get uh, as easy to to scrap but it's uh, there's some action there that i think it also makes some huge changes on the game and, and that one came up uh, after a few trials that is allows you to make some removes uh, when you draw this, these resources that you can buy, that allows you to remove cards from the market uh, for your convenience. Because the game has all this structure, like you are playing, it's your turn, you do your three phases after, mm -hmm. if you buy some some part of the market, there's some part of the market that it's a pile, it's a deck. So when you take one, there's going to be one uh, right next down there available, but there's some other that it's fed from from a deck mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. when you took some of those cars you have to wait until the end of the turn to refill that uh, so the cars that are gonna refill the market are gonna be available for your for the next player not for you so I add on the on the on the resources I add I add this action that it was already done on, a, on one of the cars that it called the merchant mm -hmm. uh, that allows you to remove part of the market with your beneficial so you remove and then what it came you would decide it if it's good for you or not yeah uh, all that yeah it probably i mean the, the, there was in the beginning of the game there was a lot of scrapping options but i i think that everything start to to uh, every every piece of the puzzles try to to get together when i add that on the resources mm -hmm. uh, so i uh, it feels right if it writes because it allows you to scrap everything you will start with well you don't play with the 108 cars you play mm -hmm. with uh with actually you play with 86 cars uh and you will see that probably in nine of each team of each of each 10 games that you're playing with you're gonna scrap almost all the cards from the market yeah because there's a lot of scrapping and that scrapping thing uh, changed a lot of strategy on the game and by uh, yeah, I, I on the beginning of the game, I only have one two cards that do that do that. Actually, the resources weren't having this scrapping option. But mm -hmm. then I figured out that well, it's gonna be great if I can scrap everything <laughs> from the beginning. So I start playtesting with that, and it turns out awesome. That's what most people like about the game, not to having fifty cards on your deck, but having. 18, 19, they're really optional and re they're, they're really optimal to, to do the attack. And because you draw five cards on your turn, the ability to garrison units and keep those on during the, your last turn, it, it creates this uh, concept of, wow, wow, I'm going to draw every card that I have on my own deck. Mm -hmm. And people really like that. People really, really love that. Uh, and the, the, yeah. and with that with that kind of thing in mind, in the rule book it meant it mentions that there are six factions, especially given the whole the whole concept of um the monarch um cards and the and their respective vassals. Um, yeah. Now I have two questions on that. One, um, what can you tell me about about each of the factions? And two. Um, what was the reasoning for doing the notion of there are six factions, but only three only three of them will be in the overall decks during a game? Okay. Well, first, uh, the factions are uh, are from the la first minute of the game where the factions were there, mm -hmm. but they were not like factions. They were uh, special characters. So uh, I can I came up with this combo idea of monarch heroes and faction units by mm -hmm. I, I might say the last year, um, yeah probably about a year ago, um, and then I I moved to a concept because when I started the game there was I don't know perhaps twenty factions not just six but mm -hmm. they were not uh, structured in a way that right now there are on the game. So when I came up with this concept, okay, it will be great because uh, one of the things that I, I felt is that when you start building the deck, you, you don't feel any, 
uh, you don't feel that you're going to be part of, of something. You're just going to buy such units, soldiers, mm -hmm. and train, I don't know, fortifications, and that's it. So it was like, oh, yeah, I have a hero, I, I don't know, Joan of Arc, which was one of the first heroes that I have. Yeah, okay. But it was just a hero. It doesn't mean that she represents a, a country or some or something. So after a while, uh, I, I started thinking about this. Why not to have this sense of uh, of uh, being part of a faction. So why don't you have a monarch, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, it happens this uh, vassal monarch thing that everyone loves because it's not that usual. The monarch is the only card that you will not put on the discard. Like the rest of the card you're going to buy, you're going to put it on the discard, but not the monarch. The monarch, it will remain at the table, so it will become your faction monarch. It's going to be, I mean... It's like saying, okay, you're taking, for example, I don't know, Richard the Lionheart, which is the, the English faction, mm -hmm. and you put it there, boom, you are an English guy. So yeah. you have to you, you have to start thinking about getting more units from that guy because the combination is going to be what makes you stronger. So uh, that, the idea of having the king there say, okay, but the king is powerful, but it's not that powerful, then the vassal come out, and okay, I'm going to take this vassal and put it on my discard. So when the vassal comes out, it means that the, the not just the, the, the king passive action has been an English king that allows you to uh, unlock the faction actions from the other cards, but also it's a powerful unit there. So, I mean, everything starts to make sense. The six factions, I started to decide to, to, to say, okay, I'm going to put six factions there. So I put the Germanic ones, the Arabic ones, <clears throat> the French, the English, I put the Spanish, and I put a sixth one, which I love because of the concept, which was the, the Camelot faction. It's not a real one, but I don't know. I like it. I love it. <coughs> so I came up with these factions, six factions. They're still not being um, uh, symmetric in the amount of cards that each faction has at that time, but then I decided, okay, I have to to decide what I'm going to do. So I started to seek real information about uh, those six uh, nations or, I don't know, it's not nations because uh, there was a time when there was not a flag with them, a representation of a flag. There was a, like, a, uh, well, it's difficult to explain, but for example, the Germanics, they're, they're Germanics, they're not from Germany. They're from Germanics, which means they're from Germany, for Switzerland, the people that together have the same uh, essence, the same concept. So I start seeing, uh, seeking on, of each one, okay, what, what kind of unit can I put there? So I came up with this idea of having one monarch, one hero at least, and two faction units. So I start seeking for the French and say, okay, well, the French knights or the Chevalier, right now they're calling Chevalier, are pretty nice. Um, what other type of unit they have? Well, they have the Bourgier. Okay, I, I added it. And that's how I start building the six factions. So this was like when the game started, there was no monarch and there was no hero. They were just um, uh, famous or not, uh, notable characters, Saladin, uh, John of Arc, William Wallace. But they don't have this um, mm -hmm. sense of being part of one faction. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. They were they were just special special units. So I came up with this six faction, and then I again we go to the playtesting part. When you start with the six factions, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you get the monarch, but probably you will end up the game without having any card from that faction. So it's like, okay, I got the monarch. I mean, I got Meister Zebran from the Germanic, but I have to wait. There's six of each cards from the faction, so. Uh, six by six is a, it's a 36 deck mm -hmm. if I put all there. So it's like, okay, I have one, I have to wait one between those 35 to come out so I can do that powerful combination between monarch and, and faction. And well, play testing again. We start with six, we reduce by five, still having this problem that you get one, but it's difficult to get the other one. And by the one we choose to play with four, it beginning to work like Okay, and with three, it works awesome. <laughs> so it works pretty nice in a way that 
you will probably have your king or your hero and you're probably gonna get some faction from that hero or that uh, monarch so you will end up with at least two or three units from a faction uh, that's why we kept three and there was a bonus on that which is replayability people think that one of the great greatest thing about the game is that you can start, start uh, play one game with three factions and then you decide to move to another three uh, so the, the it changed completely the game so with that concept i start switching a little bit the cars to put some emphasis on one or another point of uh, uh, another point of view i mean there's two factions that are really powerful with the high attack level the others that are really high defensive powers and there's some others that have a great uh, ability because they allow you to get more money and there's another ones that allow their balance between them so i create this asymmetric concept that each faction even though they have the same structure about six cars one monarch one hero one like camelot faction has two but the rest of them have one hero it's pretty much um the same concept on each faction but they feel totally different each of those because of those actions that they have uh that's that's how mm -hmm. i came up with the factions and and how and why we use three yeah um and when it comes when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to the whole the um whole co some when it comes to some of the concepts with it within the um faction setup did you was was there ever an intent to try and make it so that each of the faction kind of leans towards a certain play style yeah uh when i start with when i i had this okay we have six faction concept uh well we're gonna put some style on it so when you play the game a few times you will end up being uh, lean to one faction than uh, another it's actually how you play the game if you are a defensive guy or a, or a, an attacker a pure attacker guy you're gonna uh, choose one of the other of the factions yeah yeah i i get that i I get to the point that I want to do that in a way, and also consider a little history on on the on the cards and a little background on what type of uh, unit it's on the faction uh, on the faction deck. I mean, uh, the, the the units from Spain are not powerful because on the on the on the real life they were not really really powerful units, but they're considered a greater defender of castles. So they have a, a great defense value. Uh, so all that concept uh, leans you to decide to one faction or the other. Uh, and uh, they, they, they have this own character, each of those. Mm -hmm. And when it, when, when it comes to now, when it comes to the whole score, the whole scoring thing, um yeah. what was the, was the was the final number being 55 was that more was that more of a case of that was the number that ended up getting settled upon through testing yeah it, it was funny because on the beginning it was 50 then we moved to 70 and then i decided to go to 55 because probably no one will uh, forget that number <laughs> I mean, the, the, the guy that is playing this game, if he plays once when, I don't know, he will not play in a month and then took the game back, he will not have to say, oh, how many points it was? I mean, who game? which game has 55 damage points? Uh, and also, uh, there's another, again, another bonus, which is that uh, with all the playtesting that we, that we do, uh, usually... Um, Getting 55 damage points to your opponent takes about seven, eight, maybe nine rounds, and that's it. So again, we define the gameplay. 
time of the game by by having that 55. Uh, but it was more, uh, I, I just say 55. And I like it, and it works, and it allows you to create a, a, a an army, and it allows you to defend yourself. And if both players are and have an expertise on the game, they may uh, take a little longer to get to the 55. Probably they will get 40 minutes, 45 minutes to get, and um, maybe 12, 13 rounds. Because if you know how the game works, um, you will start. Okay, you, you you will you need to see how do you want to play and how is your opponent play because if it's a an aggressive guy you have to be defensive the first round because you know you will get to a point that even if the other player gets a lot of uh, power during their attack if you get a, a lot of, a lot of a defense on your on yours you are defending yourself with a high value and also you were keeping keeping uh, a lot of cars in your uh, garrison that are not the five that you have in your hand. Well, all that thing, after a lot of playtesting, well, 55 was the number. <laughs> uh, and I really like the idea that, okay, it's not 50, it's not 60, it's not 100, it's 55. Uh, yeah, it was more like I decided to put it. And it get this 30 minute gameplay average with those 55. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the, now one of the other things that I that I definitely noticed when it came to so when it came to so, when it came to soldier units and the like is having what appears to be three different classes, um, a melee ranged and and um what I'm assuming is a mounted when it comes to when it comes to like horsemen, um, yeah. and obviously there, obviously there's stuff like there's stuff like monarchs, but I want to focus on those first three because it kind of it kind of builds a a um trinity. When it comes to yeah. like how how do how do those three um interact with each other? Is it a rock paper scissors thing, or are there certain rules that each one has to abide by? Uh, no, the type of unit uh, what it does is to create combinations with different cars. Uh, they're not just three, there's a few more, uh, but mainly you have uh, three uh, as a soldiers. You have three, which is store, archers, and horsemen. But there's also some siege units and fortification. Each of those has a representation, uh, a symbol or an icon on the game. And there's a lot of those that how you combine them between together or against each other. It's that what makes uh, one stance over the other. I mean, trying to keep it uh, always the theme on the game. For example, the fortifications has a, they may have a great or not attack value. I mean, uh, a, a catapult has the same uh, uh, attack value as a knight, but the thing is that against a fortification, it increased that amount of damage. So it's pretty much like it happens on a battlefield. The 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 siege units are are powerful, but they're really, really powerful against fortifications. Keeping that in that concept, same happened with the units. Okay, if I have a a, a crossbowman, one of the strategies of, of uh, archery on the medieval was to have in um, a straight line of cross of crossbowman because it reduced the amount of uh, units that can be attacked uh, and they can uh, hold an attack better. So that concept in a, in the car it says, okay, this is ha has a two value attack, but if it's along with another cross crossbowman or another archer, it increases one more attack. So those combinations, uh, you, you you will use the 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 different type of units by those combinations. So. Yeah. Some are powerful or not. Actually, there's maybe some weak. Uh, if there's one type of, I mean, for example, if you have the monarch Richard the Lionheart, and you are on the table, he has a passive action that it avoids the attack of one siege unit. So if you have a siege unit, it's awesome. But if you, if the other player has you know, the, this king, the, well, it's not that great. <laughs> so this. It's pretty much combinations. There's no rock, paper, scissors thing. I mean, the, the, 
one is not going to win the other one because it's a type of unit, but it's going to be more powerful because of the combination of the type of unit. Mm -hmm. Now, now, when it comes, now when it comes, one other thing that I was that I was curious about, especially given the, especially given the head to head. Yeah. Is the is um the concept of reversals, um, and what I mean by that what I mean by that is ma is making it so that one, so that one um, one if one player has an, has enough of a headway that they're not completely out of the woods, um, is that is that something that you've seen happen in play testing where somebody seemed like they had a lead and then um. One a careless move ended up turning that around. Uh, I I don't get that. that uh, I I don't understand. Uh, uh, what? I uh, actually I don't understand the question. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. What What I mean by when it comes, what I mean by is are is it po is it possible for rever reversals to happen when it comes to the when it comes to point to when it comes to point totals and the like where somebody. Who know somebody who has an idea of what they're doing can, um, rec can recover from ha from having a lower from having a lower point score compared to their opponent. Oh uh, well, yeah, yeah. If you know what you're doing, mm -hmm. I mean, probably you will not get that on the first two or three times that you play the game. But um, if you know what you're doing, um, uh, even though there's some luck on the game because the the the, the card has to be dropped to I, I'm, I'm sorry has to be refilled on the market to to have an opportunity to buy them uh but if you're seeing that your opponent is heading to one way to to one way to attack you uh you have a lot of strategies to avoid uh larger attacks because the thing is that y you know it's you have nine rounds probably an average of nine rounds so you know that on the first three four rounds it will be one two maybe three four damage attack and that's it well may have a one a six damage and that's it so you know that by this six seven round if you don't do the things right you probably gonna receive attacks from your opponent from 20 25 30 points so if you're seeing that uh, how do your opponent is combining the cars uh you have to start thinking about in a way they say okay i'm gonna be more aggressive and let's do this clash head to head okay you're you're hitting me with 20 to, with 20 when i try will try to hit it with 25. um that's one of the strategies to go right straight to the i mean knock the heads out uh, between both players or you may say no i will get to my I will get more defense. I will create more defense structure, and because this the game has two ways to defend yourself, uh, that people really loves loves that is that depends on the cards that you're dealing in the marketplace. It's your decision to say I'm gonna try to be more stronger than my opponent. Once you know all the cards that are around, uh, you have this beautiful scrapping option mm -hmm. that allows you to do some strategy, not just for uh, for, for buying cars, but also to avoid your opponent to buy cars. Yesterday, for example, we're playing with a guy that I I didn't have any hero or 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 monarch from my faction from from the Germanics. But as soon as I begin the game, I start building, I start buying uh, the faction unit from the Germanic, hoping that maybe the king or the hero come up and I can do that combination of that combo that make more powerful my deck. So it was a point because the other player doesn't know uh, anything. He was uh, was the first try of the game. There was a, a point that the monarch of my faction came, came out and he has the option to remove it from the table and that will make me my strategy to fall off and the, he will get even though we were having this high difference of numbers i was about 45 points and he was 20 uh but he did he didn't do that decision so i kept going with my my main strategy and i win but if he by that time decided to remove that monarch and allows me avoid to 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 me to get it 
well, probably he will win the game. Mm. That's how sensitive the, 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 the cars are. Uh, so it's really, really uh, a decision because uh, there are some decisions that you can take during the game that it may change this, the, the, the whole concept of the game. Uh, and it allows you to be the defender and all of a sudden become the attacker mm -hmm. because you do some uh, switches in your deck that allows you to be more powerful in just two rounds. Uh, if you know all the cards, you can do that easily. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the, the, there's a, the, there was a game the other night that I, I was f losing by 30 points. He, the other player was 42 and I was 12 and I ended up winning it because I start with the concept of, okay, I, I cannot go straight to attack. I'm going to defend myself. So I get rid of uh, small fortifications to get the biggest one. So all of a sudden he has a huge level of attack. He has a 20, 21, but I have a huge level of defense. So if you know how the game works, well, if you avoid being attacked, it's more important that uh, that uh, actually attack yourself. So yeah, you can change a strategy during the game. <laughs> you can do it a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. And with the, taking that taking that into account, now I know that there I know that there was that whole accidental six six minute um, lot. Live yes. of the live of the Kickstarter for Clash of Armies, but you guys, unless I'm mistaken, you guys are planning on launching the Kickstarter properly on November 10th. Am I correct? Yeah, correct. Um, how how long do you see that going? Do you do you plan on having that go for 28 days, 30 days, or 60 days? No, no, we're going for the 30. We're going for the 30 days. Yeah. I I I think that we need that. Uh, well, it was a bad thing what happened with the missed lunch that we have. But there was a point about a, a few months ago that we decided to put this this date to start with the game because it's like uh, well it's uh, we do a lot of steps on the game. Mm -hmm. uh, probably we were in a regular world when nothing happens and everyone uh, trying to get together and I can have the opportunity to show the game uh, to, in conference and everything, well, we, we probably will help the, 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 the Kickstarter at least to, to next year. But we came up with the game that it's already done. I mean, the game, the art of the game, it's all for the game and it's all done. So it likes well what well, we thought that it will take a whole year because of of this COVID thing is the the artists have less jobs uh, they have le less commissions from from another uh, of their customers so they start working a lot with the game so we by May maybe by June we already have the game done so it was like. Okay, we have the game done. We're gonna wait until one year to release the game because of this thing. We're not we're not do by by June. We wouldn't know if next year we're gonna be available to show the game or not. So we put it as a date. Mm -hmm. uh, we say okay, let's let's launch October. Uh, let's launch after SNHPL because we're gonna be part of the. At that time, we expect to be part of the SNHPL. We were aware, but it was that was another issue. Mm -hmm. um, so we put that date, and we want to do we we want to have the, the experience to launch. Uh, uh, I think the game has a great concept in it. Uh, I hope the, the it will the people that 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 sees the game find that they might be interested to play well along with it. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the the date is going to be ten November ten. And it's gonna last thirty days, yeah. All right, all right. And I'll def I'll definitely be be um keeping an eye on keep an eye on that. Um, when it comes to that, when it comes to that Kickstarter, as, as, do you do you plan on ha do you plan on having the Kickstarter for um for both a print and for both a print and play and physical version, or is this mainly going to be for a physical version of Clash of Armies? No, no, we're going to... Uh, there's going to be available a print-and-play edition. I mean, there's, an, uh, there's a free one that is around, 
uh, that you can actually play with the game. It came with only three factions. Uh, but the thing is that we are uh, we redone all the, the the graphic design of the car. We kept the 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 same design by now because we're play testing with it. But for the physical game, for the the copy of the game, it's going to be different cars. I think they're way better. They have a better icon uh, identification now of the attacks and defense and everything. And the print and play edition. So if someone there was there's going to be a pledge level of print and play edition and with the thing that the the physical world the physical game is going to be available in english and in spanish but the print and play edition is going to be available in nine languages um this game has this collaborative concept uh maybe two minute history i i have a friend from germany last year allows me to show this game on essen I was heading to Germany because I have to work there for another thing, for my real lifetime job. Mm -hmm. So uh, because it was only five days away from the Essen, I, I stay there, uh, take my days off, and I show the game in, in, the, in his booth. He's a miniature painting guy. Um, so he allows me this table to, to show the game. And a lot of people play with the game and really like it. So I came to Argentina. And I decided to go for it. By that time, the, the, the media of the game, the, the art of the game was all stolen from the internet. Uh, so I post, uh, um, I create a gameplay of the game mm -hmm. and I post uh, on a Facebook group, okay, I have this idea and three artists joined me, but they joined me not as commission, they joined me as a partners. They create all this art because they want to get involved of the of the board game because they were they were not artists from the board game uh, world they artists from media journalists and so, and everything else so they want to get into the the the, the board game market and decided to go for it and, and they decided to be partners for me and this collaborative concept which is okay we're going to we're going to budget the game and if we get succeed we all get paid um I take that concept to other people. So I take that concept to English people that they do the, the edition of the of the rule book and the, they're working on the cars. And it turns out that Japanese, Portuguese, Italian guys really like the concept uh, of being part of a game. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we, if, we, if we succeed, we all get uh, pay and we are, we're going to be really happy about it. Uh, so it turns out that Right now, it's eight languages available, and each of those languages is not Google Translator on anything. Each of those languages has a natural speaker of that language. So the print and play edition of the game is going to be available in those languages, Russian, Portuguese, mm -hmm. Japanese, Italian, French, Spanish, English, and I forgot someone. I think it's Korean. Yeah, Korean. All those are going to be available as a pledge level on the Kickstarter. Just for a few few bucks, you can buy the print and play edition. Mm -hmm. And I, I will, like I said, I will definitely be looking forward to seeing how that develops. Okay, awesome. Um, especially, especially, especially since some, um, I will be very disappointed if in a year I do not, I do not see somebody using Clash of Armies to make a you and what army joke. <laughs> Oh, well, that would be awesome. I don't think I don't know if it's going to happen, but that would be awesome. <laughs> if if worse um, comes to worse, I'll just I'll just end up using the old adage of if you need, if you want to get something done, you got to do it yourself. Yeah, um, yeah, I think so. But with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time to come out to come come all the way up to the temple and brave the hell that is time zones. Yeah. Well, I, I, I thank you so much for for giving me the opportunity to to well talk about the game a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, that yeah, usually uh, I'm usually playing it and and speaking about uh, it's also awesome to, yeah. to speak about because it reminds you all the path that you took to to get to this point. So mm -hmm. yeah, thank you so much. My pleasure. And of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Yep. And last but certainly not least, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time to enjoy the show and the madness that follows. 
And there'll be more madness where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!